back he wants, if he wants to talk about it, if he wants questions and answers. I don't know what it will give, what he will choose. Uh, he has entire freedom to manage his talk. Thanks. You didn't see? Anyway, could you make me some tea? Tea. Yes. I figure you should be an expert on that. <laughs> Can I have a guess? <clears throat> First, I'd like to mention, <clears throat> are you gesturing for, uh, for communicating something to me? Okay, good, because I didn't understand and I off people make gestures at me and they expect me to understand and usually I don't know their code. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, I just make gestures back hoping they'll understand that I don't understand. I'm happy to say that I have now installed a completely free GNU slash Linux distribution on the computer I use. It's called Ututo. For many years, people have been asking me what distribution I was running, and I was not very happy telling them because it was a distribution that uh, distributes non-free software. In fact, Nearly all the distributions of GNU slash Linux include or come with some non-free software. For many years, when people asked me where to get a copy of GNU slash Linux, there was nothing I could tell them. There were places I could tell them where an expert could distinguish the free from the non-free and could install only the free software. But there was no place I could tell a non-expert, here you can get a system and it will be free software. And finally there is at ututo.org. So uh, our sysadmins at the FSF were working on this, getting it set up for me and it finally seems to be set up and I'm doing my work on it and I'm happy to say I'm a user of Ututo GNU Linux. Yes, although I generally don't use the graphical user interface. My work is all with text and it's much more efficient for me to use a text terminal. But it has graphical interfaces which are what a uh, non-wizard would use. So when it's reasonably done, please tell me. So <clears throat> I'm here to talk, though, about version 3 of the GNU GPL. From the beginning, from the first version of the GNU general public license in 1989, we expected there would be revisions. Version 2 was developed in 1991. I'm the main author of every version of the GNU GPL, but I've always had help from a lawyer. In the past, it was Jerry Cohen. For this version, it's Eben Moglen, who I first began working with in the mid-90s. The, reason, the reasons for this revision are many, because the changes are local and, and mostly small. There is no big change in GNU GPL version 3, there can't be and must never be. The basic idea will always be the same. <clears throat> We've changed specific parts, or well, we're changing specific parts of the GNU GPL to respond to specific issues and also put explanations of all the changes in the rationale document which you can find in the site gplv3.fsf.org, along with the draft text itself. That site exists for the sake of comments. 
It exists not only so that you can see what we're proposing to do, but so that you can say what you think about it, and in particular, so that you can give us constructive suggestions so that we can make sure we get it completely right. So please do go to the site and look at the rationale document. It's still quite hot. What? It's still quite hot. Yes, it's probably done by now, right? Yeah, it should be. So uh, now it has to cool off. If you could get some more water to heat up, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there are several, uh, among the changes, the most important four, I would say, concern dealing with software patents, compatibility with other licenses, <clears throat> the definition of which parts of the source code and what constitutes the source code that must be included, and dealing with digital restrictions management. <clears throat> I was just reading the details of a new pl plot by IBM, Microsoft, Disney, Actually, I'm not, I can't remember for certain now if IBM was in it. It was Disney, Microsoft, Sony, and Intel, and maybe IBM was there too. It's called AACS, and it's the new digital restrictions management system for the future. <clears throat> and it's designed to restrict the use of movies and software. It involves designing computers such that they are hard for people to take control of and modify. <clears throat> Anyone who's going to be allowed to make devices that, that can work with high definition TV would have to sign this, I believe. <clears throat> and these requirements include not only designing the thing such that users can't control it and can't modify it, but they even are promising to stop making analog outputs. An analog output is considered to be a security hole. The their idea of the computers of the future is there will be no analog output ever. You will not be able to connect the computer to any monitor except one that's designed to receive encrypted video. <clears throat> now, these conspiracies to take control of our computers away from us are, are becoming more arrogant and blatant and shameless every year. These companies know that they have too much power, and they figure they're going to use it, and they're going to impose on us their picture of what the world should be like. <clears throat> we have to try to resist this in every way we can. Some people have suggested that uh, people should buy this hardware and return it to the store and buy it and return it to the store. They, think that, they said that that makes life too difficult for the stores. Well, I'm looking at a different way of trying to resist these plans, and that is to make it possible to, for them to corrupt free software. You see, what they want to do is distribute to the public software which theoretically is free and practically speaking is not. They want to distribute GPL covered software to the public and say these binaries are under the GPL and yes we'll give you the sources if you ask and the sources are under the GPL and yes you can modify them you just won't be able to make any use of the modified version in our computer. Because if you install it, it won't actually run 
it, or it won't actually do anything useful. So after thinking about this, I came to the conclusion that that is not really respecting the user's freedom to change and share software. And the purpose of the GNU GPL is to establish and guarantee that freedom. So the GNU GPL version 3 is designed to make sure you really get that freedom to prevent our software from being corrupted by treacherous computing or digital restrictions management. But it does this in a very clever way. At least I think it's clever. It doesn't use the obvious method. It doesn't limit what technical jobs the software can do, because that's another principle of free software. People should be able to use the software and run it for any purpose and change it to do whatever they like. So we have not said you can't change this software to do the jobs that you would do if you were trying to restrict people. Instead, we focused on a different aspect of DRM, which is stopping the users from controlling the software that runs in their machine. Treacherous computing is designed such that if you modify the software, it won't be able to do the job. And it's done by means of things like checksumming the software and using the ch and checking whether it has been signed and authorized. And so if you modify the program and you install it, it's, since it, your version hasn't been signed by them, your version isn't really authorized. So either it won't run, or it won't be able to open the files that you want to open, or the network server will refuse to talk to it, or in one way or another, it will be blocked from really doing the job that the original version was set up to do. So what we're doing in GPL version 3 is we say they're welcome to design free software to, to uh, do whatever it is they want, and they're welcome to set up the machine such that it won't run a program unless it's been signed, but they have to give you the signature key so that you can sign your own version. Ah, oh, thanks. Oh, well, then I, I guess I should wait a few more minutes. So they have to give you the signature key so that you can authorize your version at least to run on your machine. Now, if each machine has a different signature key, they only have to give your signature key to you, your machine's signature key. They have to give it to you. They don't have to publish it. They don't have to give it to anybody else. They could even promise you that they won't give it to anybody else, but they have to give it to you. So this ensures that you really have, practically speaking, the freedom to modify the program, put it into the machine, and have it really run. And it must be able to do the same jobs on the same data, which means it must be able to access the same files that the unmodified version would have accessed, or talk to the same network server that the unmodified version would have talked to. So whatever is needed to get any particular version, Whatever the program needs to be able to give the network server so that the network server will talk to it, they have to give that to you. This won't, this won't stop, um, I can't hear you. This won't stop um, uh, distributions being able to distribute signed binaries. Not at all, because uh, he, sa he said it won't stop distributions from including signed binaries. When the purpose is to prove this is my version of the binary and it wasn't changed by someone else, that's a completely different scenario. Because they're not giving you a machine that refuses to run software unless it's been signed by them. And therefore, there's no requirement on them. 
So for instance, if you want to distribute binaries or sources of your program and sign them so that people can tell they're your authentic versions, you, you're still free to do that. And they can still get the corresponding public key and check your signature. The reason that, the, that these requirements in the GPL don't apply to this case is because in this case, the user checks if he wants to. It's not a machine that's checking and refusing to run the software if it, if it wasn't signed by you. If you give them a machine that won't run the program unless the binary has been signed, then you have to give them the signature key. But if you just sign the binaries or sources and say, check this if you wish, the requirements don't apply to that case. Because the requirements say that you must include whatever keys or codes are necessary to authorize a modified binary so that it will function the way the original binary would. If it isn't needed to make the modified binary function, there's no requirement. <clears throat> so that's one thing that we worked on quite a bit, figuring out how to block the use, block the corruption of our software for digital restrictions management without limiting the technical features it can have. So we, instead of attacking the technical features of DRM, we attack the thing that makes DRM evil, which is the fact that it's been taken out of the user's control. So we, we blocked, we thwart DRM by insisting that the user must retain the control of his machine. And as long as you respect that, you can program the software to do whatever you like. <clears throat> now, a second, what are you, what are you talking about? Say, speak up, because I can't, can't hear you. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if I need oh. somebody for the microphone. No, not now, because oh, I'm not finished yet. Um, a second major area was how to deal with software patents. We decided that the implicit patent licenses that we were relying on in GPL version 2 were not solid enough, so we put in an explicit grant of patent license on the part of whoever distributes the software. Any, if, if, if she gives you a copy of the program, she is implicitly giving you a patent license for any patents she has or controls that you would need to infringe in order to run the software or use its output. <clears throat> And in this, we're following various other free software licenses that came out during the 90s. But there's one controversial point about it. You see, the mega corporations that have blanket cross licenses often don't even know. Well, actually, actually I skipped a step. The next thing is, suppose somebody's distributing the program and he has a patent license. So he, know, he thinks the program infringes some patent, but he has a patent license, so he's not going to be sued. But you might get sued if you redistributed it. That's not fair. So we put in a requirement that he, if he knows he's relying on a patent license, he has to do something to ensure that he's shielding you as well when you carry out the freedoms that the GPL gives you. And this is a matter of honesty. If he distributes the program to you and says, this is under the GPL, you're free to redistribute this. And if at the same time he knows that if you redistribute it, you'll get sued, even though he can't get sued, that's dishonest. So we require him to do something to, sh to make sure you won't get sued either if he knowingly relies on a patent license. On the other hand, if he's just taking his chances, he doesn't have to do anything special. If he's in the same boat with us already, that's the most we can ask. <clears throat> but this is complicated because there, there are mega corporations that have blanket cross licenses. Two mega corporations say, we'll cross license all our patents and they don't even know what they have patent licenses for. 
So this is why we put in the knowingly rely on part. Because we don't want to impose a requirement on, say, IBM to do something for other people when IBM doesn't even know that it has a patent license for a certain patent. So we put in those words knowingly rely on. And this apparently is rather controversial, exactly where that line should be drawn. But it's actually a pretty small change. Another big change, comparatively big, is that we have decided to make the GPL compatible with some additional free software licenses that are incompatible with GPL version 2. It's a practical inconvenience, this incompatibility. And it's nice to get rid of it. We can't get rid of all these incompatibilities because that would require eviscerating the GPL, making it null effectively. The GPL requires that users must get certain freedoms and we can't allow the addition of absolutely any requirement. But instead we decided to, to list a specific set of additional requirements that are okay. So other licenses can add requirements of those kinds. For instance, they can make specific requirements if you could heat up another specific requirements about how to give notice of changes or which kinds of credits to preserve or uh, statements that uh, you mustn't use our names for publicity and also there are a couple of more interesting requirements that are also permitted in the other compatible licenses. One of them is the Afero GPL requirement that says if you run this for public access, you must provide a command to download the sources. So the Afero GPL is, is the same as GNU GPL version 2 but it has one additional condition which says if you, put a, if you put any version of this program on a public web server, you've got to have a command that the user could use to download the source of your version. So we were thinking of putting a requirement like that into GPL version 3 together with a way that people could explicitly activate it. But then I decided it would be much simpler just to let this be a compatible license and people could put this compatible license on files of their program if they want to. It has the same result. So GPL v3 will not make this requirement but it will be compatible with licenses that have this requirement. And then there's another kind of requirement that GPL version 3 is compatible with and that is patent retaliation. There are several free software licenses that have patent retaliation clauses where they say that uh, if you sue for, patent, for software patent infringement, then you lose the right to use and distribute this program. And the details vary. They're ver because different licenses work this out in different ways. So we drew up a criterion for acceptable software patent retaliation clauses. And they are allowed now in GPL version 3 in compatible licenses. So a license can be compatible with GPL version 3 and contain a software patent retaliation clause, but only certain kinds of software patent retaliation clauses. There are two kinds that we've said are okay. One kind is where retaliation only occurs against aggression. 
You see, if, if party A sues B for patent infringement, the thing B is most likely to do, if he can, is countersue. So if, pa if party B has a software patent, party B will look for a way to countersue. So we've decided we want retaliation only against A, not against B. We want retaliation only against those who commit the aggression, not against those who are themselves retaliating. So we found a way to make the distinction. And the, the second kind of software patent retaliation clause that's OK is where <clears throat> it retaliates only for lawsuits directed at the same code or code that was released with it. That is, retali retaliation for software patent lawsuits that are targeted very close to the same program that we're talking about. <clears throat> so this creates a somewhat complicated situation because it means that a GPL covered program can have parts that are under these co compatible licenses which make certain kinds of other requirements. To help make it clear to the user what the rules are for using any particular program, we said, all these licenses have to be collected and put in one file, which you can easily find. And I, th I think it says it has to have a certain name. I don't remember actually that detail. But the result is it'll be easy to look at a GPL v3 covered program and find out all and see all the other licenses. And these other licenses will be limited. They can't be absolutely anything. The, they can give additional permissions any way they like. But as for, giving, for making additional requirements, we have this list of five or six kinds that they can be, and that's all that's allowed. And I've told you just now what they are. <clears throat> then the other place where we're doing some work is in the definition of complete conning source code and what has to be included in that. Which some changes that are a bit subtle in the system library clause. The clause that says you can distribute a binary with, for a non-free system and it's been linked with some non-free system libraries. This is a special exception. We've done some rewriting of this to try to modernize it more for the way those systems work now and, <clears throat> and at the same time to limit it a bit more to avoid loopholes where they want to extend Emacs with a non-free extension, so they write a special library in their system, which is the Emacs extension library, and then they distribute a binary of Emacs linked with it, and they say, ah, this is a system library. Uh, we're making sure that that can't be done. <clears throat> what time is it? <clears throat> and uh, let's see, the, I, I was just remembering another change and it zoomed out of my mind. Uh, so I guess I'll just ask for questions. By the way, the GPL version 3 will be finalized either in October or early next year. There's plenty of time to comment, but don't wait, because we're going to make an, another draft in uh, July, I believe. And if you want your comments to bring about changes in that draft, which would be really desirable if you've got good comments, please go to gplv3.fsf.org and give us your comments now. Study the draft, look at the explanations, and then see if you can see a scenario where this text would not do the right thing. 
and give us your feedback. So now, questions? I don't know. I, a couple of weeks ago, I was told that there had been 500 comments. But I'm not reading the comments directly. The comments go to discussion committees. There are four discussion committees. And what the discussion committees do is they aggregate the comments to make issues. Each issue is basically some question we need to think about. And they connect each issue with the comments that raise it. And then they write up the issue. And during May and June, I will be studying those issues and looking for what to do about them. But you, I think you can see the existing comments on the site. And the idea is that each comment will be connected with an issue and that eventually the issue will, be, will have a response. Now, in some cases, the discussion committees will write the responses. But in some cases, I'll actually look at, at making changes, and I'll eventually write the response. Um, what you've said so far makes perfect sense. But one of the great things about GPL version 2 is that it was quite simple for programmers to understand you could explain to somebody, even somebody who was not really a specialist, what this license meant and what uh, requirements it imposed on somebody who wanted to That's use That's only it. partly true. OK. I, I think, don't the, exaggerate. OK, there was a great deal of understanding, I'll grant you. I'm worried about this, that there are so many different and overlapping requirements that it would be very difficult to explain to programmers. I don't what think GPL it's more going means. to be more, I don't think it's going to be more difficult. It is longer. It has to be. We can't see a way to do these jobs that's shorter. But I don't think it's harder to understand. Remember, GPL v V2 was not, is not as as you are now giving it credit for. Uh, I wish it w could have been, but there are parts of it that we had to explain repeatedly. That's why we have a FAC. Uh, there are parts of it that are quite subtle in their interpretation. We're tr we've clarified a lot of points. I haven't been talking about that because those are not major issues. You can see those clarifications if you take a look. I don't think it will be harder to explain GPL v3 than GPL v2. But if you can point out a specific spot that you think is hard to understand, maybe we can make it easier to understand. So please give us that kind of comment, too. Please speak louder, because I can't hear you. We have a lot of code with GPL2, which doesn't have the or above clause. That was a mistake. Yeah, OK, that was a mistake, but uh, we have this code. And it, either those people will relicense it, or they won't. Uh, I see a problem here. If then we'll have a lot of code, which is GPL, but we can't put it together That's right. to a new thing. That's right. And that's unfortunate. That's why I say it was a mistake on their part to release it under GPL v2 only. But yeah. there's nothing we can do about it. We need to make these changes. We're, the GNU project will release code under GPL v3 or later. We're going to do that. Uh, and I hope that other people will come along, but it's up to them. Is there a possibility to make a clause that you can link together GPL 2 no, and 3? No, can't. Uh, if we did that, it would, uh, <clears throat> well, you know, maybe some kind might. I'll, I'll have to think about it. We need to start releasing our code under GPL v3 or later and not under GPL v2 if we want to make this resistance to uh, treacherous computing take effect. But please send me a message, and I will see if there is some way that we could extend compatibility. I will think about whether it's a good idea. See, the, 
The, or the other, actually though, it's hopeless. And the reason is, I, I now realize, it's, it's impossible. And the reason is, even if GPLv3 allowed it, GPLv2 doesn't. So it real, it's, it's absolutely impossible. The only way that code could ever be linked into GPLv3 covered programs is if that code says you can link this in GPLv3 covered programs. And the way to do that is to release it under GPLv2 or v3. But I hope they'll actually say v2 or later or v3 or later. That's the way to permit it. Yeah, uh, about the requirement to distribute to distribute keys um, in order to defeat tree shirts computing. Um, I'm assuming that, let's say, you release uh, Emacs binaries that are signed by you, just so people know that uh, yeah. you approve them. And I build a device that will only run code that is signed by you. Does does it force you to release the key? No, because I'm not, if I have no connection with your device. And if... But if you distribute, but on the other hand, if you distributed a binary in that device, or for that device, you would have to distribute my key, which you couldn't do, which means you'd have to make a different key. Or, and you'd have to provide that key to your customer. Yeah, or my other concern is, let's say I'm big, uh, a big corporation, IBM, whatever, and you actually work as m one of my employees on free software, and you, sign, you tend to sign your binaries, and suddenly I decide that I'm building a device that uh, will only trust your key. Ah, when and you I'm do not that, distributing when you key. do that, that's the point at which you had better pay attention. The fact that you have employees uh, signing, that, that people are signing code, that's irrelevant. It's when you decide to build a device that won't run things unless they're signed, that the, restrict, that the requirements apply to you. Yeah, but I'm not distributing the software. You are. I'm only making a device that will only trust mm. the original developer's sig uh, signature. The well, that's, that's, wrong. that's a bad thing key. to do, and it's intentional that you're being stopped from doing that. Because when you do that, you're restricting the user. Yeah, but I, if I'm not distributing the software, I can still build a device. And the software developer, even if he works for that company, would be forced to release his key? Absolutely. Or, or the company would have to not make products like that, which it shouldn't do. Those products are exactly the evil we are trying to stop. Yeah, no, I understand that part. I'm just concerned about if, for example, I was doing free software and I work for a certain company, and that company starts making, without me knowing it, they start making a device they'll, that uses my key. They'll have to stop making that device. They're not distributing the software, so they can't be made yes, to stop. They, well, maybe to they do can. Maybe they they want. You work for them, so yes, they are. The point is, uh, I mean, it's by your own assumption, you're assuming that you work for them. So, yes, they are distributing the software. And uh, they better not make machines designed to restrict people from changing yeah, it. But I've got no power over them. So if they do it, it means that I need to give up my own, not the company's key, my own key. Because well, or they have to stop. Yeah, maybe so. Or maybe they just have to not hire you. Or maybe they have to not make those devices. Those devices are evil. Yeah, no, I understand that part. I'm concerned more, not you, about the company. This is a weird, bizarre scenario. I think it doesn't matter what happens in such a weird scenario. However, I do think it matters to make sure that we for successfully forbid them from distributing those machines. So what I'm going to take a look at, I'm going to think about this scenario. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to promise you anything. But the problem I'm going to be addressing is to make sure they can't distribute such machines. Those machines have got to be blocked. They should not be allowed. I want to make sure that our license successfully deals with the first case you raised, where a developer is signing his binaries 
and somebody else decides to make a device that will only run those binaries, and suppose they're not related. I want to make sure that gets blocked as well. How would you do that? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to talk to a lawyer. The point is that that kind of device is the threat that must not be able to exist. Yeah, I agree on that. What? I agree on that part. I'm just concerned about I don't about know how, how do I'm do going it. to solve the problem. Sorry, I, you know, maybe I'll find a solution, but I don't expect I can. It's too much to ask that I should find it for you now. Well, sure. I'm going to have, it, it may be a hard problem. It may take me a lot of work, or I may fail. The point is I'm going to work on this problem because it's a, it's a danger. Yeah, the my, my, existence of devices designed to, to, you know, I want to make sure that this kind of system can't work well enough to become common. Yeah, the, the main part of the, the comment I had was not about the company, but just making sure the developers are never forced to release their key. This is the I'm main not, I really don't care about that. I want to make sure that, the, that machines can't stop users from running modified versions. That is far more important than any other of these questions. I don't know you. I don't know what you mean. Do you mean the limits on what can be included in compatible licenses? Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah. Oh, because there are some patent retaliation clauses that we think retaliate too much, and they're bad. And we didn't want to encourage such by making the, making the GPL accept them. For instance, there's some licenses that have a patent retaliation clause that says, if you sue us, us alone, then you lose the, the right to, uh, to use the software. Well, what if we first sue you for patent infringement, and then you counter sue us? You see, what this means is that those patent retaliation clauses because they're too, because they're unfair, they can be used to support aggression. So we want it to be compatible only with clauses that that do not become supports for aggression with patents. And in general, if there's some other kind of patent retaliation clause which we can convince ourselves would not be a support for aggression we could conceivably include that too. But we looked at all the free software licenses that include patent retaliation clauses, and we saw that there was none of them that we would want to include that we thought was legitimate that isn't already included. That is, we drew this line, and it includes the ones that we should include, and the others are all far away. There's nothing just on the other side of the line. So I guess it's time to stop.